this is a free for all. This is a lot of talented people in one place. I'm just here to talk to Susan Nimoy. <laughs> a lot, a lot of praise for her. So that may just be what we're doing. That's exactly something that we do. I said, would you like to direct one of the segments for us, please? Yes. I would love to. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to open it up to questions, but I also want to invite all of you to speak when you want to speak. And I want to congratulate every single one of you for this beautiful program. Um, anyone out there? Oh, good. Yay. We can see you. Yes, sir, David. David Holbrook. <laughs> Jason, what the fuck? <laughs> oh, good, Jason. Have this happen. <laughs> I, I produced, a, two years ago, I made a film called Suited that I worked on with Stacy and Erica and Jenny. Um, and it wound up here, and coming off that experience, I think we all wanted to work together. So when Sarah Bernstein brought this idea, um, I was part of the initial discussions. Let's bring Sarah Bernstein up. Yeah. Come on, Sarah Bernstein. From HBO. Come on, Sarah. This is our executive, the Lenny executive from HBO. Yeah. Come on up. Smart. was um, there are a lot of assumptions about women who wear hijab that maybe they don't have any hair underneath their scarves or they don't care about beauty. So the idea was, you know, just to listen in, like you're sitting in a salon chair and you're hearing whispers of conversations that are going on and to try to do it in a way that respects people's um, you know, religious traditions, so we concealed the faces of a woman who wore hijab, we gave them a voice, we showed their hair, but you couldn't see their whole face. So it turned, the theme turned out was, you know, what, what women in salon talk about, how we see ourselves, and in, in this particular salon, also how people see us. And this is constantly that, you know, sort of tension between how we see ourselves and how other people see us, and that was kind of the inspiration. Um, access was a hard thing. This is a hair salon I used to go to since I was a teenager. It's down the street from my mom's house. Where, what city? It's in Chicago, in the southwest suburbs of Chicago, predominantly Arab American community, so that's where we shot it. I realize I didn't do a good job introducing you, the directors and identifying you with your short, so could, would you mind just passing the mic and letting people say what their short their name and their short one more time. Thank you. Sure, I'm Christine Turner and I directed Dead is Better, which is about the writer Alyssa Bennett. Yeah. I'm Jason Benjamin. I directed the short on orgasmic meditation. <laughs> and I'm Tony Gage and I directed Funny Girls. <laughs> I'm Elizabeth Ido and I directed Laws of Another Universe, a Gabrielle Ruffer's story. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, yes. Um, for Susan Nimoy, thank you so much. I really, I very much enjoyed your, your piece, and I wanted to hear how um, you look at the beginning that this was um, something that you started writing when you were 15 years and I wondered how the experience might have been for you. Writing is, is very grounding. I'm not a writer. 
but I discovered that writing is very grounding. And I, I practically needed 12 dish towels in the seven or eight months it took me to write this because each day I came in to write, I was allowing myself to connect with the, the loss and the fears and, and everything. I was all alone in there and no one was judging, least of all myself. And in the purging of all this emotion, I found myself feeling lighter and slowly stronger. And as the piece took shape, I, I began to, to have sort of disassociate it, disassociate from it, and realized I was telling a, an important story about what it is to be a woman of age who's going through grieving and that there is hope for a life after that, uh, and, it, and it sort of ain't over till the fat lady sings. <laughs> That's, that was my takeaway. I actually wondered from Alex and from Susan, can you tell us a little bit about, and, and the producers, how you shot the, the love scene, the sex scene? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you guys want to know that? Kind of, yeah. um, it was um, it was a nerve wracking day for both of us. I think uh, me having a widowed ninety year old grandmother and a mother who's sixty five and single. There was a lot going through my head uh, <laughs> leading up to this day. Um, we luckily we shot it in Susan's son's house. We had some rosé in the fridge. I drank a lot of that, <laughs> um, and. We were both, uh, we didn't do a lot of talking when I first showed up to the house. Um, and we kind of blocked it out and went through it and I got into the living room and I was there with Diana and her husband and Susan and Susan just walked up to me. She took her clothes off just in front of me and I was like, okay, we're gonna do this. <laughs> uh, and then we just kind of freely shot this piece. Um, each take was probably 20 or 25 minutes, I think we did two or three takes. Um, and we discovered a lot about each other throughout this process. Um, there were a lot of tears from both of us, I think, throughout it. Um, and it was amazing, it was, it was an exploration we got to do together. All right, I wanna say about this. Um, I had written a very different scene. And <laughs> I think that this is, that's why, Truly, working with a team, it is a collaborative experience, and and it was important to stay open uh, to to the input from from everyone. And uh, the scene I had written was traditional and boring, and I hated it. And I I actually was very nervous on that day for that reason. Diana and her husband Jim came up to me, and they showed me a video of a piece of choreography with that crazy music that we played in the middle of that of the 80s that right after the 80s dancing that crazy music and i said thank you you have solved the problem i can do away with that scene that was boring and traditional and explore what that music might do to Emmett and Eve. They wouldn't let me hear it. <laughs> we wouldn't let him hear it, but we asked him uh, if he liked to dance. And he said he loved to dance. So with Jim Frona, this amazing uh, director of photography, uh, who strapped that <coughs> camera onto his chest, and, trust, and, and we trusted each other, and it was essentially an improvisation. We didn't rehearse it. And my memory is we shot it all in one take. And then I looked at the monitor and I said, whoa, this is good. And then I said to Jim, Jim said to me, I'd like to cover a piece here and there of it. Is that okay? And we said it was. But what unfolded on the floor and what happened with the tears, both from um, Alex's uh, Alex and for me was totally an outgrowth of the moment. For me, the end result was an emotional catharsis for me 
um, given the nature, given what I had gone through. And personally, for, for Alex, so it became not a scene so much, and not at all about an older woman having sex with a younger man. I hope that you got that. <laughs> it was really about two people coming together and having an emotional experience. And uh, it was very organic, and we left it at that. We didn't try to go back in and fix it. Jim Frona is a genius. That's all I want to say. <laughs> he also shoots um, I Love Dick and Transparent, right? Yeah. And, oh, if I can say that he's going to be shooting Big Little Lies next season. Big right? Little Lies. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so I just mentioned that Julie, who's our editor, yeah. and um, Louise, who did all of the post-production supervising as well as producing. Um, it really is about taking those 25 minute takes and making it art, so I just wanted to call that out. So <laughs> Did everybody hear that question? It's such an interesting question. No. No. Okay, I'm going to try to repeat it. Can you feed me lines? Um, yeah, please. <laughs> Do you like being remarkable or unremarkable? <laughs> I love being remarkable. <laughs> um, I look forward to that day for sure, but I love hearing women's stories, and I think they're remarkable every time I hear them, and I kind of can't imagine a day when I won't be absolutely enthralled with what women talk about, think about, dream about, and make. Um, we we had oh Erica can tell a story about our shoot that was in Rhode Island and here we go. We came down in the lobby of our hotel and we were getting ready to set out and shoot and everyone was assembled and it was this team of all women and then our sound guy showed up. He was local. We sort of picked him up in Rhode Island and he walked in the lobby and he's looking around and he said, oh, are you guys all here to, to work on Dead is Better? And I said, yes. And I started introducing him to everyone on the team. And he said, I've never worked with all women before. And it was just this great moment. And I was like, okay, well, get used to it. <laughs> and there's Shauna Hagen, the, the DP yeah, of, of Dead is Better. better. Wait for him, Shauna. Iaba, did you want to, will you chime in? Um, <clears throat> sorry, I lost my voice. That's um, all right, we can hear you. It's <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and I guess I'll also add that, so I produced Asia's film and Ajador Nawal, and we were, I think, I did the math, we were like 88% also women of color um, on our crew, and it was just incredible to be in a place for both women of color and a crew of mostly women of color, um, both really coming from the same place. Someone asked me the other day if the women in the salon were constantly looking at the, um, the um, monitor, and they weren't, because they, didn't, they weren't concerned or even really interested in what we were capturing. They just knew that we were gonna get them right. And that kind of just, easy trust was probably the first time I've ever felt that on a set. So it's really meaningful on that level as well. I'm gonna go out to, there was someone here. Yes. Um, I have a question for the director for um, Dead is Better. How did you find this, this woman and um, who's the subject of the film? And did you change your mind? Like, what did you think of her and did it change from the beginning 
Sure. Um, did so, everyone hear that? Yeah. yeah? OK, great. Um, actually, the producers of Lenny came to me with a very loose concept. They asked if I knew about this writer, Alyssa Bennett. I did not. Um, I was very intrigued, though, about her writing, having spent four years in a funeral home. I think they thought, who might be as equally obsessed with death as Alyssa? <laughs> Let's talk to Christine. <laughs> Um, and I think that, you know, as any documentary filmmaker, I sort of approach any project with a certain amount of skepticism. We're trained to do that. Um, and immediately upon meeting Alyssa, I was taken with her. Um, her writing is, and we just get a sample of it here, is complicated and messy, and she's this very imperfect person and very honest. And I think she really relishes in this sort of lowbrow meets highbrow style of writing. Um, and it was actually, despite the dark topic, incredibly fun to work with and work on. Elizabeth, I just want to, I really, really want to hear you speak too. Talk about um, your animation and it, do you always work in animation? Is this, and is this always your style? And what's the genesis of this story for you? Is it really personal? Uh, well, this is actually Gabrielle Rucker's story, um, so it was a kind of a challenge to figure out how to make it the right amount of length to make it a doable thing in animation. And yeah, I, I've always worked in animation. Um, I mostly do storyboards, and then I moved on to directing stuff, um, directing uh, like Adventure Time for Cartoon Network, which is a thing. <laughs> So yeah, I guess I just got directing experience from that, and I directed my own short for Cartoon Network, um, which is really nerve-wracking because it's so collaborative and just the design of everything and um, animating stuff. For me, it's impossible to do alone, so I have to kind of have a team of designers that I really trust to um, explain what I have in mind and then have them execute it. Um, and I think it turned out beautifully. And, uh, I really hope Gabrielle likes it too. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, I just want to add one thing, which is, so Gabrielle had done, um, we do this thing with Lenny Letter called Lenny IRL, where we have people read their stories, and Gabrielle was very funny and very dry and read that story, and I didn't even know anything about The Sims, but I became obsessed with it, so that's how this came about. But Elizabeth, I just, <laughs> the perfect way to describe, in my opinion, what the kind of thing she brought to it, because it was already a really funny, complicated story. It's like, <laughs> when she has the character who's about to kill her sister and all her friends put the scrub <laughs> in, <laughs> but that's how she's getting ready to murder. I was like, oh my god, this is the most genius animator on earth. <laughs> and I thought that was, it was such a, it was such a great collaboration. It was really exciting to see that come to life for me. It's really cool. And that was the one that was actually a Lenny Letter, that was first a Lenny Letter. Yeah. Will there be more um, direct from Lenny Letter docs or nonfiction pieces? <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. We hope so. <laughs> Got it. Okay, back out to you. Yes, in the back. Hi, this is a question about process. So for either uh, Jenny or for Stacy. Uh, as you were developing these stories, were there any that you came across that you tried to get to a place where you want to shoot, but they didn't work out because of certain criteria? <laughs> <laughs> Erica, you wait, sorry, that. We have a 20 page document of story ideas. If that gives you. Yeah. We're going to produce a lot more of these, I will say. Um, there were a couple that we had trouble with, a, like a booking for, or, or, yeah, that was just like a timing thing because at that point we knew we were coming to Sundance and we couldn't get it scheduled in time. So we scrapped that. I mean, lucky for us, HBO is so supportive. They gave us a budget that we, we knew we, there would be like four or five in the final episode but we were able to kind of explore and develop other ones um, and then sort of see what we liked best. There was one that um, Sheila was like, I really want to see a woman on a tractor. <laughs> <laughs> and we were just like digging for tractor stories. Just couldn't find a whole lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was every farmer. What was there's like some farmer, you know, women, female farmers who want to date on Tinder or something. <laughs> We're going to find it eventually. Okay, we have time for one more. I'm looking up there at our 
peanut gallery. Anybody? No? Just wanted to include you. Yeah. Hi. Oh, hi, Jonathan. Hi. How are you? Um, a very inspiring evening. Thank you. Um, I don't know if I'm the only person in the room that felt a little uncomfortable that the orgasmic piece was the only piece that was directed by a, a man. <laughs> <laughs> Say more about that. <laughs> Why did it make you feel uncomfortable? Yeah. I don't know. I felt that in a, in a series of films directed by women, the one film that was about female orgasm and, and internal uh, content, uh, com confidence, maybe, it just fell off. I mean, I, I hear you, but I think if you are paying attention all deeply to the story, it's very much about two people working together to achieve that orgasm. So. I think um, having a man enter that story is just as organic as having a woman enter that story. And we had a woman DP and a woman editor, and he, he pitched it to us. <laughs> <laughs> so frankly, it would have been very bad manners to get something else. <laughs> um, oh, she's giving me one more, but I, what I wanted to say was, before we go to the, oh, oh, oh Sean, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, um, uh, Susan, fantastic work. I was wondering what's next for you. Is Eve becoming a feature? Because I feel like it could be. I think so too. <laughs> I'm working on it really hard. So thank you for the encouragement. <laughs> And I wanted to point out that I thought what was really interesting was the relationship between all of these shorts and, and Eve, your film, and especially between the beginning, which was Eve, and the end, which was orgasmic meditation. I thought, so Jonathan, for me, because they, were, they came back around and connected, it, it dissolved any discomfort or any thoughts about anything because it, the, the program connected so well. So with that, I'm gonna leave you, we're gonna leave you looking at these fabulous filmmakers and artists. <laughs>